So, he, today we will talk about synthetic polymers. So, this will again be a reasonably brief talk. So, I will I'll only focus on uh, things which have been studied extensively. So, obviously, you can look at any synthetic polymer as long as it is biocompatible. Uh, however, we will focus on some things where people have actually demonstrated reasonable success with respect to using it for tissue engineering applications. Okay. So, uh, why do we want to be use synthetic polymers? Yeah, as long as natural polymers do the work, we would not have to uh, look at synthetic polymers, right. But we already discussed natural polymers have some serious limitations, right. Uh, source could be a problem because it can actually cause immunogenicity and contamination issues are there, uh, batch to batch variations are there, uh, your properties uh, are not really tailorable. There are some problems which has made people look at uh, synthetic polymers. So, uh, the advantage is uh, they are more uniform and uh, they have predictable chemical and mechanical properties. Uh, however, uh, problem with this would be it is a foreign material, right. It could have some problems, but uh, you can actually design it for specific purposes. You can actually make it free from toxins and contaminants because you are going to be synthesizing it in a lab you will have a lot of control over the quality of the material you are producing. So, uh, you have choice over the monomers, the initiators, reaction conditions and any additives you want to add to the polymer and so on. So, this way you can actually tailor uh, many of the properties like crystallinity, melting and glass transition temperatures, molecular weights and side groups. So, these will give you desired properties which will actually uh, be suitable for appropriate applications. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if I'm going to say an implant, an implant is generally uh, not biologically active, in the sense that it is just there to you know, provide some kind of a replacement. Okay, it is not helping in regeneration of the natural tissue. A hip and joint replacement is an implant. Right, so you basically use a titanium alloy and you put it in the body. That is not going to help in your bone growing back. Whereas a scaffold, a tissue engineered scaffold uh, is supposed to help the bone to grow back. So, that is why if you were to use a hydroxyapatite uh, ceramic, that would help in bone ingrowth. It will help in the cells for attaching and uh, formation of new matrix and it will integrate itself with the bone, with the existing bone. So, that would be a scaffold uh, from a tissue engineering perspective. Uh, Implant. implant will usually be inert, yes. But there are some degradable bio implants which yeah. can be helpful for the bone growth, right? Uh, so, you have degradable implants, yes. So, de degradable uh, sutures, all those things are there. So, because it is not uh, permanent, does not make it bioactive. I am talking about activity. So, if you are going to load, so if you are going to use something where you are delivering molecules, then it automatically becomes active that would make it more uh, related to a uh, delivery mechanism. So, it is a signal uh, based approach, so which we are talking about, right. So, uh, here we are looking at the material itself which can help in cell adhesion and so on, okay. So, does that answer your question? Okay, so what was the material you are talking about when you are saying uh, material or degrade? Like degradable implants are there. Okay. Of course, the so, reaction it will be made to uh, the you know the prolonged the immediate degradation it will lead to that uh, bone growth. Yeah. So uh, I haven't actually read a lot about uh, magnesium uh, and its bioactivity. I know Professor Sampath Kumar does that, so I don't know uh, exactly the biology behind it. But if mag magnesium by degradation can actually stimulate it, then it would actually be a bioactive material. So, like a hydroxyapatite, right. So, it just depends on uh, the biology behind it. I am not very confident about the biology of uh, magnesium. Because nowadays all the implants are coming with hydroxyapatite coating only. Mm -hmm. So, that the reaction will be more. Like yeah. active, bioactive in nature. So, that, that is for host integration. So, to make sure that if you have a hydroxyapatite, some ceramic coating, it makes sure that the cells can attach and your chances of dislocation and uh, loosening actually come down because it now integrates with the bone, right. So, that is the idea. So, host integration is another aspect of uh, implantation. So, that is um, another major concern when it comes to even tissue engineered products, right. How you integrate it with your body is going to be a question. Okay, so uh, 
with synthetic polymers you have certain advantages so people have tried different synthetic polymers and uh, they always stuck to things which have already been proven to be biocompatible. Most of the there are a lot of uh, biocompatible synthetic polymers that are known many of them have even, be appro even been approved by FDA for uh, specific applications. It might not be specifically for tissue engineering, but you would usually have it uh, approved for various applications and uh, if it has shown to be if it is shown to be compatible then you would want to try to see whether it is actually effective as a tissue engineering scaffold. So, uh, broadly these materials are classified as uh, biodegradable and non-degradable. Biodegradable are the ones which basically degrade in your body in vivo, non-biodegradable do not degrade inside your body. Uh, so, examples for the biodegradable would be PLA, PGA, PCL and so on. These usually degrade based on hydrolysis. It is a simple hydrolysis reaction which will just degrade these into uh, products that can be excreted out. Whereas, uh, non-biodegradable uh, do not usually, uh, it cannot be hydrolyzed, there are no enzymes which can actually break it down. So, because of this uh, they have to be confined for specific types of implant, like if it is going to be a permanent implant, then you might want to use a non-biodegradable material or you would try to chemically modify these uh, non-biodegradable materials to make it biodegradable. And uh, you can also use it uh, in blocks of low molecular weight, so that there can actually be uh, elimination from the body. So, for example, polyethylene glycol is uh, not biodegradable, but below a certain molecular weight, it can actually be ex excreted through your kidney. So, if you use it in that molecular weight, then it won't be a problem. It can actually be removed from your body. So, uh, PVA, polyacrylic acid polyhema or all some of the examples of non-biodegradable materials which have been tried out for uh, tissue engineering applications. So, uh, we will go through some of these uh, in reasonable detail. So, this is PGA polyglycolic acid. So, this is a linear polymer of glycolic acid. So, glycolic acid is uh, actually produced in your body during normal metabolism which means the degradation products of a polyglycolic acid are not going to have any uh, toxic effect in your body. Uh, however, this material itself goes through bulk degradation, it is not just surface degradation, surface etching is not what happens, it just go, uh, bulk degradation happens which means uh, it can actually get degraded reasonably quickly. So, in vivo degradation happens only through hydrolysis, this process can also be catalyzed further uh, by molecules which have uh, esterase activities. So, the enzymes that are uh, that have esterase activity can uh, rapidly hydrolyze uh, PGA. So, the uh, in vivo degradation studies have shown that it usually loses its strength within the first 2 months, 1 to 2 months it loses its mechanical strength and complete degradation happens within 6 months. So, this has been approved for FDA, it is approved by FDA for uh, biodegradable sutures. So, uh, you would have come across these in surgeries, people now use biodegradable sutures rather than the regular sutures, so that you do not have to go back again for removing the suture, right. So, th these will actually be absorbed by your body. So, uh, this is one of the most commonly used polymers uh, which are bioabsorbable, so it has been extensively studied, there are uh, commercial products out there which use PGA. So, yeah. Produced in the body or even PGA? No, glycolic acid is produced in your body, so not PGA. Poly, uh, polyglycolic acid is not produced. You can actually uh, prepare polyglycolic acid, which just gets hydrolyzed to glycolic acid. Tissue engineering studies of uh, PGA have actually been uh, done. People have shown that different types of cells can actually adhere and grow on top of these uh, cells, on these polymers. Another set of polymers uh, which have been studied extensively is PLA or polylactic acid. So, uh, here these are actually made from two different monomers. So, one is it is possible to use lactic acid and uh, prepare uh, the polymer. Other option is to use the cyclic diester which is lactide and then prepare this. So, the direct condensation of lactic acid monomers to form uh, PLA should be done at temperatures which are milder. So, only then you would prevent the formation of uh, cyclic diesters. So, if cyclic diesters form, then you go for uh, through the ring opening polymerization of the lactide. 
so which uh, is can be catalyzed by different metal uh, catalysts so using this you actually prepare uh, pla and lactic acid itself actually exists in uh, two optically active forms which are d and l so lactide which is a cyclic diester can I exist in three isomers it could be l lactide d lactide or dl lactide and the polymerization uh, can form semi crystalline polymer or an amorphous powder depending on what is used for prepare which uh, stereoisomer is used for preparation of pla so if pla is uh, formed then it is semi crystalline or uh, dl pla which is the both d and l uh, together that forms an amorphous powder so uh, the advantage is you can actually tailor the uh, strength and the degradation rate based on this so PLLA is slow degrading with very high tensile properties because of this it has actually been studied for many uh, bone applications commercially it has been approved for uh, orthopedic fixation devices so like uh, bone screws and things like that so they have actually used PLA for doing this and uh, the D and L combination has lower strength and a faster degradation rate so we can try to combine these to get uh, desired properties so PLA is also used uh, is the one of the most commonly used uh, inks in 3d printing most of these 3d printers would use PLA so uh, PLGA is basically a copolymer of these two so this is to try and use both the advantages <laughs> okay so uh, ring opening copolymerization of the cyclic dimers of uh, glycolic acid and lactic acid is done to get this PLGA so what people have shown is there are different forms of PLGA can be formed based on the initial concentrations initial molar ratios of lactic acid to glycolic acid and they are usually written as PLGA x is to y where x is the uh, concentration uh, percentage of lactic acid and y is the percentage of glycolic acid 75 25 means 75 percent lactic acid 25 percent uh, glycolic acid so the advantage of doing this is the physical properties themselves can be tailored so uh, this also degrades by hydrolysis in the presence of water uh, the rate of degradation actually can be related to the monomer ratio mm, if you have very high glycolic acid then the rate of degradation is faster because glycolic acid PGA we saw that had a faster degradation compared to PLA right so it would have faster degradation however this uh, correlation is actually not linear so in some points it does not actually fit that one example is 50 50 uh, PLGA PLGA 50 50 actually shows uh, much faster degradation which is actually faster than both PGA and PLA so uh, I do not know the chemistry behind it uh, but in general this has been observed so PLGA has been approved for many drug delivery uh, applications and has also been extensively studied for tissue engineering applications uh, people have shown many advantages to using this uh, there are some disadvantages as well because of the acidic nature of this material you know, the pH in the localized uh, regions could actually become lower which could cause uh, cell uh, death and it could ca cause some damage so people have shown in some studies have shown that so uh, trying to use this uh, has its own advantages and disadvantages polycaprolactone is an aliphatic polyester uh, with semi crystalline properties so the repeating units are uh, one ester group and five methylene groups so the structure you can see there it is a highly water soluble uh, polymer uh, and this is formed by ring opening polymerization uh, to form degradable ester linkages so the degradation occurs by surface or bulk hydrolysis of these ester linkages so degradation can actually be degradation is actually very slow and uh, it can actually be present in your body for up to two years so it is usually uh, used for processes where the regeneration is going to be very slow so PCL has actually been used in uh, bone tissue engineering applications so they have shown that osteoblasts can actually adhere to this PCL and uh, produce ALP ALP is alkaline phosphatase which is a marker for biomineralization so when ALP production is increased then you know that there is mineralization of bone so people have shown that when osteoblasts are cultured with PCL it shows an increased ALP production so to 
uh, optimize the rate of degradation many studies have tried to use PCL copolymerized with other materials like PEG and PVA and so on. So, the ones which we looked at till now PGA, PLA, PLGA and PCL are all biodegradable. So, the ones which we are looking from here on out are non-degradable, non-biodegradable. PEG is a non-biodegradable material, however, it is very highly hydrophilic, it has very good swelling ability. So, because of this reason it is actually used extensively in uh, formation of hydrogels. We will look at what hydrogels are and uh, we will go into details of hydrogels later, but can you tell me what you understand with the term hydrogels? Have you come across the term hydrogels? Okay. So, it can absorb water, right? Okay. So, that would be one person. Highly hydrophilic. Okay, highly hydrophilic. So, uh, if you were to take a sponge right, and you dip it in water, that also holds a lot of water, right? So, does that make it a hydrogen? It should interact with water. It should, it should hold water. So, it is not just that it absorbs water, it should also hold water. A sponge, if you squeeze, the water is going to come out. Whereas, a hydrogen, if you squeeze, the water will not come out. So, uh, PEG is used because it can actually form hydrogels which are very hydrophilic and it can actually absorb a lot of water. Uh, the advantage of that is uh, it will have very limited diffusion uh, problems, right? If it, if it can swell very nicely, if the network can swell very nicely, nutrient transport is going to be very effective. But the other side of it is the linear chain actually leads to rapid diffusion of the material outside of it, which means it just dissolves away and uh, it has very low mechanical stability. So, for this reason people try to create PEG networks by attaching functional group to groups to PEG and try to cross-link it using covalent or uh, other types of cross-linking. So, this is non-biodegradable non but can be degraded by copolymerization, can be made to be degradable by copolymerization with other degradable polymers. And as I already mentioned, below a molecular weight threshold, it can actually be excreted by your uh, kidneys. So, if you were to use it at that molecular weight, then it is usually not a problem. Yeah. So, uh, would activated charcoal be a hydrogen? No. Why do you think it would be a hydrogen? It does not absorb water, right? It, it just uh, yeah, absor absorbs other things. It's, So, uh, polyvinyl alcohol uh, is another commonly used uh, material. So, this is a water soluble polymer with excellent biocompatibility. Lot of studies have worked with PVA and shown that it is uh, very useful for biomedical applications. And uh, polyvinyl uh, alcohol itself is not very stable. So, it is synthesized using a two step process. So, it is not just a direct polymerization of vinyl alcohol which is done. So, what people do is uh, they uh, do the first, first step is the free radical polymerization of uh, vinyl acetate and uh, the second step is hydrolysis of the polyvinyl acetate to form PVA, polyvinyl alcohol. So, this hydrolysis actually can be controlled. So, you can have varying degrees of uh, hydrolysis. So, just like how you have uh, varying degrees of deacetylation for chitosan, you can have varying degrees of hydrolysis for PVA. And based on the hydrolysis, degree of hydrolysis, the mechanical and the physical properties can actually be different. So, it has been used in many applications of PVA, there are actually review articles which talk about PVA for tissue engineering applications, you can go and read it up, it is done for many different things. Only limitation with PVA is it is so hydrophilic that it does not support cell adhesion very effectively. So, in some cases, uh, you, so you actually need to maintain a balance when it comes to hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. If it is going to be very highly hydrophilic, it does not uh, support the cells as much as it should. So, because of this reason, uh, people usually uh, use it along with other natural polymers. So, various, uh, various types of natural polymers have been used along with PVA, cellulose and cellulose derivatives, hydroxy, uh, sorry, uh, hyaluronic acid, uh, collagen, all these have been blended, blended with PVA to improve its cell adhesion properties. 
So, this is just a bunch of other synthetic polymers uh, which have actually been studied. So, you have uh, polypropylene fumarate, polyorthoester, polyanhydrides, polyphosphazine, polycarbonate and polyurethanes which have all been studied for different applications. Polyurethane, so these are all approved for uh, biomedical use and they have been shown to be biocompatible. So, people have just tried it for tissue engineering applications. You will be able to find papers which talk about uh, other synthetic polymers as well, but these are some of the more commonly used uh, synthetic polymers. So, another class of uh, polymers, synthetic polymers would be the conducting polymers. So, uh, polymers in general do not conduct electric, uh, electricity, right. So, they are very poor conductors of electricity. So, there are a special uh, class of polymers which are called conducting polymers. So, these were these are, this is actually a Nobel Prize winning discovery. They won the this discovery actually won the Nobel Prize in 2000, I think, uh, for chemistry. So, uh, the conducting polymers which are shown here are polyaniline, polypyrrole, and uh, P dot, which is polyethylene dioxythiophene. So, these are some of the common uh, conducting polymers. So, these as polymers themselves have conducting properties. However, they have some limitations because uh, they do not have the desired mechanical properties. They actually are brittle when uh, they are fabricated into scaffolds and other materials. So, they are blended with other uh, polymers to, pro uh, to prepare uh, conducting polymer composites. Uh, so, these are they have actually been fa fabricated into multiple things and have been used for uh, different tissue engineering applications where electrical properties of the scaffold play a role. And so, uh, uh, people do try to uh, prepare these uh, materials in different ways and uh, we will actually look at how to fa fabricate these scaffolds. So, fabricating a scaffold is actually a, a crucial aspect, right. So, having a polymer is one thing from the polymer to actually make it to resemble the ECM is a serious thing which we need to look at. So, the fabrication strategies have to be optimized. There are many different strategies. So, these are just a bunch of them uh, which I have shown here and uh, you can look at many other things as well. So, uh, leaching uh, methods where you have solvent casting and salt leaching, ice particle leaching, gas foaming and salt leaching, these are all some of the leaching methods and you have microsphere formation where you can have biodegradable microspheres or macroporous beads or particle aggregated uh, scaffolds being formed and uh, phase separation methods like uh, free freeze drying or thermally induced phase separation could also be tried and uh, fiber spinning methodologies to form nanofibers, microfibers, uh, non-woven fibers and so on. Injectable gels uh, can also be prepared, uh, 3D printing is one of the latest technology where people are trying to print uh, many of these things. Okay. So, these are some of the uh, scaffold fabrication strategies, we will uh, discuss some of them here and uh, 3D printing I will discuss in greater length in the next lecture. So, uh, this is solvent casting and salt leaching. So, this is a very simple technique. So, all you do is you take three things, you take the solvent uh, polymer and a salt. So, the salt here is NaCl. So, you could also use sugar or whatever, right. So, it is something which can form a crystal. So, you basically mix all of these and now what happens is the salt has actually dissolved along with the polymer and uh, you pour it in the uh, mold, whatever the mold could be. So, here they have just shown a disc like mold, you pour it in this mold and uh, once it is dried out, uh, so you keep it in room temperature or in vacuum to evaporate the, sol uh, evaporate the solvent. So, you now what you have is a polymer uh, disc in which the salt is dispersed all over, right. So, you put it in water and wash it. So, what will happen is you would have uh, dissolved all the salt away. So, now the positions in which the salt was present have uh, these pores. So, that is a salt leaching technique and uh, then you can freeze dry it to uh, eliminate all the uh, remaining uh, solvents and so on. So, this is a same image of a solvent cast uh, salt leached uh, material. So, you can see nice cube kind of pores. So, this is this is where the um, salt crystals were present. 
right. So, there is those got washed away and you actually got these pores. So, but, uh, here what do you think would be the advantage of uh, this technique? Any porous material will give you more surface area. So, this specifically has some advantage. Uh, so, semi permeable properties, these are all interconnected. Okay, uh, that's actually not correct. We'll get to it uh, in the next thing. But easy fabrication process. Because okay, so it's a, it's a very easy process. That's one thing. Uh, what no else? Okay. Uh, okay, so milder conditions uh, for processing, all that is fine. Okay, so you are able to get regular uh, pores. So, okay. Uh, I will rephrase it slightly to fit what I want to say. So, you can actually control the porosity. So, based on the salt concentration and the type of salt you use, the pore, pore size and pore distribution can actually be controlled. Okay. So, that is the advantage here. So, uh, as far as your claim of it being um, interconnected pores, it is actually not true. So, if you were to look at these points. So, these are actually deep pores, right? So, you are the ones where you see the dark black or deep pores. Whereas, if you look at these spots, which are more grayish or even whitish, they are actually not uh, deep. So, those are like you are saying the polymer surface itself, right? But these are actually pores which have been formed. So, those are places where the salt was present and it has just been dissolved away. So, in some cases, you would have gotten interconnected pores, in, but in many cases, you would actually not have very good interconnectivity in this method. Okay, so, to get better interconnectivity, that is why you do gas foaming and salt leaching. So, what you do here is a polymer gel uh, is prepared and uh, instead of just adding salt, you add a uh, salt which is which can actually release gas. So, uh, an example would be ammonium bicarbonate. So, you add this and then you actually uh, evaporate the solvent and put it in water or put it in a buffer, what will happen is uh, you will have the carbon dioxide getting released from this, right. So, this gas is going to get uh, released from the scaffold which you have prepared. So, when the gas comes out, it is going to create these pores. So, that you will end up with a um, porous scaffold. This after drying and freeze drying, you can get a macro porous scaffold. So, the scaffold will look like this. So, if you look at this, even the smaller of the pores would actually have some of these connections where you would actually see that it is uh, reasonably interconnected. So, you would have very small, th those are the places where the gas would have escaped out and created these pores. So, because of this, these are, this shows a very good interconnectivity. So, that is the advantage of using gas foaming technique. Okay, so, but these are all very simple techniques which people have been using where they have shown that uh, you can create porous structures. But what would be the disadvantage of this compared to the uh, salt leaching? Oh, it is density, density would be way less for any porous material. If you have increased porosity, your mechanical strength is going to come down. Okay. As long as you keep increasing your porosity, the mechanical strength will have to come down, right? Because you have pockets of uh, just air. Can you elaborate? What do you mean accumulation? It is non-uniform. So, whenever I ask what is the disadvantage of this compared to something else, it would usually be the advantage of the other technique, right? So, the other technique uh, you had control over the pore size and porosity. Here you, you have reasonable control over the porosity, but not really the pore size and so on, okay? The distribution, pore size, all those things you are not, it is not very well organized. So, microspheres, you guys would have prepared it for uh, different applications, primarily for entrapment of enzymes and things. So, the same thing can actually be used in tissue engineering applications as well. But people do not generally use just a microsphere. Although people have earlier studied it, nowadays people just do not use a microsphere by itself because that does not uh, resemble what your ECM is. So, people will use microspheres along with other materials. So, where you can use the microsphere to load molecules and so on. So, uh, microsphere shown here is quite simple. All you do is dropping it while the uh, cross-linking media is spinning and you create a microsphere. So, this is a simple PLGA microsphere, I believe, on which uh, human disc cells are actually cultured. So, this shows that cells can actually adhere and depends on the material you have chosen. 
and you will get nice beads uh, of uniform size. All that you need to control is the viscosity of the material, the rate at which you actually uh, release the material into the media and also the uh, diameter of the pore which is used for releasing the media. Freeze drying is another commonly used technique. This is actually one of the more popular techniques which is currently being used extensively even more than salt leaching or uh, uh, gas foaming because it's it's really really simple. All you do is uh, dissolve it, mold it, freeze it and dry it. That's it. As simple as that. So, you actually uh, create pores because of this freeze drying technique. So, uh, we in the last class or some class I actually discussed freeze drying, right. So, freeze drying uh, is a lyophilization technique where you actually have uh, a sublimation process happening. So, can somebody actually draw the phase diagram for water and explain the sublimation process? How would it look? Pressure versus temperature something like this right so which region is which high pressure low temperature is solid. high pressure low temperature is solid okay then um, high temperature low pressure is gas what steam. which is one that this one yes yeah. steam okay okay this is liquid Confident? Okay. Okay. So, you guys are doing thermo now, right? So, now that you have the phase diagram, can you actually uh, tell me what's the process of lyophilization from here? Basically, at a low temperature, they reduce the pressure. So, all the water comes. So, so directly it goes from solid to liquid. Yeah. There is no liquid. There. You yeah. just have to go here. So, instead of, see, so usually solid goes to liquid and then to vapor. So, instead you just, so it depends on which pressure region you are in, right. So, if you are in a very low pressure, so that is why you create vacuum during lyophilization and that vacuum, you make sure that uh, you can actually uh, sublimate it at uh, low temperatures rather than uh, heat it and where you have to have a vaporization process. So, the advantage is it is, uh, it creates pores as well as it does not damage the material. It is a very, uh, it is done at low temperatures, right, very low temperatures. So, because of this it does not damage the material. So, this is actually, this was a scaffold which we developed in our lab. This was prepared by lyophilization technique. So, you can see very nice pores which are there and uh, like very nicely interconnected and uh, it resembles a, what an ECM would look like, right. So, this is a. What kind of microscope is used to Oh, it is a scanning electron microscope. So, uh, we will discuss characterization extensively. So, there will actually be, uh, there is a lot of things which you can use. Uh, so, this is a scanning electron microscope. There are different microscopes which can be used for such things. So, uh, you get these images. So, even the image which I showed, most of these images are actually SEM images only. This is, this is also a scanning electron microscope and this is also a scanning electron microscope image. So, for observing surface morphology, SEM is the most common method used. So, another technique which is commonly studied is electro spinning. So, in this technique what you do is uh, you take a syringe and you fill it with a polymer solution and the syringe dispenses the polymer solution which is exposed to a high voltage environment. So, and this basically uh, breaks the um, polymer flow into thin fibers which uh, is collected by a collector which is grounded and the collector can actually be a rotary drum, it can be a flat surface and so on. So, depending on the uh, collector surface you can actually get either non-aligned or aligned fibers. So, this is electro spinning. So, you get uh, very thin fibers, uh, nano in the, a few nanometer thickness is actually possible when you get these things. So, this provides a very uh, high surface to volume ratio and uh, it also provides a nanofibrous mat uh, which resembles ECM in many of the tissues. So, for these reasons people actually work with uh, such uh, electrospun fibers 
So right now people are also trying to use electrospun fibers on which uh, the, you actually have these um, freeze dried material on top. So it will be more like a combination of both which actually is more close to what an ECM would be. People are trying different things and these are some of the technologies which are used for uh, preparing the scaffolds. So we will talk about 3D printing in the next class. 